Man is a singular creature. He has a set of gifts which make him unique among the animals, so that, unlike them, he is not a figure in the landscape, he is the shape of the landscape. This is the Pacific Ocean. The California Indians used to say that at full moon, the fish came and danced on these beaches. And it's true that there is a local variety of fish, the grunion, that comes up out of the water and lays its eggs above the high tide mark. The females bury themselves tail first in the sand and the males gyrate or dance around them and fertilize the eggs as they're being laid. The full moon is important because it gives nine or ten days between these very high tides and the next ones that will wash the hatched fish out to sea again. Every landscape in the world is full of these exact and beautiful adaptations by which an animal fits into its environment like one cogwheel into another. Millions of years of evolution have shaped the grunion to fit and sit exactly with the tides. But nature, that is evolution, has not fitted man to any specific environment. On the contrary, by comparison with the grunion, he has a rather crude survival kit. And yet, this is the paradox of the human condition, one that fits him to all environments. His imagination, his reason, his emotional subtlety and toughness make it possible for him not to accept the environment, but to change it. And that series of inventions by which man from age to age has remade his environment is a different kind of evolution, not biological, but cultural evolution. I call that brilliant sequence of cultural peaks the ascent of man. Of course, it's tempting, very tempting to a scientist to hope that the most original achievements of the mind are also the most recent. And we do indeed have cause to be proud of some modern work. Think of the unraveling of the code of heredity in the DNA spiral, or the work going forward on the special faculties of the human brain. Think of the philosophic insight that saw into the theory of relativity or the minute behavior of matter on the atomic scale. Yet human achievement, and science in particular, is not a museum of finished constructions. It's a progress in which the first experiments of the alchemists also have a formative place, and the sophisticated arithmetic that the Mayan astronomers of Central America invented for themselves independently of the old world. The stonework of Machu Picchu in the Andes and the geometry of the Alhambra are constructions as arresting and important for their peoples as the architecture of DNA for us. In every age there is a turning point, a new way of seeing and asserting 
the coherence of the world. It's frozen in the statues on Easter Island that put a stop to time. And in the medieval clocks in Europe that once also seemed to say the last word about the heavens forever. There's nothing in modern chemistry more unexpected than putting together alloys with new properties. That was discovered about the birth of Christ in South America and long before that in Asia. Splitting and fusing the atom both derive conceptually from a discovery made in prehistory. That stone and all matter has a structure along which it can be split and put together in new arrangements. And man-made biological inventions almost as early. Agriculture. The domestication of wild wheat, for example, and the improbable idea of taming and then riding the horse. So, these programs or essays are a journey through intellectual history, a personal journey to the high points of man's achievement, what the poet Yeats called monuments of unaging intellect. Where should one begin? With the creation with the creation of man himself. Charles Darwin pointed the way. It's almost certain now that man first evolved in Africa near the equator. This is a possible area. The valley of the river Omo in Ethiopia near Lake Rudolph. The ancient stories used to put the creation of man into a golden age and a beautiful legendary landscape. If I were telling the story of Genesis now, I should be standing in the Garden of Eden. But this is manifestly not the Garden of Eden. And yet, I am at the navel of the world, at the birthplace of man here in the East African Rift Valley near the equator. And if this ever was a Garden of Eden, why, it withered millions of years ago. I've chosen this place because it has a unique structure. In this valley was laid down over the last four million years, layer upon layer of volcanic dust. Four million years ago, three million years ago, over two million years ago, somewhat under two million years ago. And then the Rift Valley buckled it so that now it makes a map in time which we see stretching into the distance. These cliffs are the strata on edge. In the foreground, the bottom level, four million years old. And beyond that, the next lowest, well over three million years old. The remains of a creature like man appear beyond that and the remains of the animals that lived at the same time. The animals are a surprise because it turns out that they have changed so little. This is the topi antelope now. The ancestor of man that hunted its ancestor two million years ago would at once recognize the topi today. But he would not recognize the hunter today, black or white, as his own descendant. Among the animals, the hunter has changed as little as the hunted. The serval cat is still powerful in pursuit, and the oryx is still swift in flight. Both perpetuate the same relation between their species as they did long ago.